Hi everyone and welcome or welcome back to Felina's Pages. Today I have a very special guest joining me. It's my friend and number two hater. <laughs> it's Ida! I still can't tell hold on, I haven't started starting for me because I don't know Editing Queen. Anyway, okay, so this is Ida <laughs> and today we're going to do I haven't told her the name yet, but the series is gonna be called Book Talk book talk bro <laughs> can you think of a better name though <laughs> okay no that actually did kind of be <laughs> so today we're talking about the world famous book talk inheritance game series which has been popular on book talk for like way too long <laughs> it's been like what two years since it first came out but basically the inheritance games is a story about this girl boss named Avery Kylie Grams, and she's like this teenager and she's so normal coded. But then one day this guy shows up and he's like, actually, my grandfather, he's been requesting your presence at his reading of his will because he doyed. <laughs> uh, she, so she shows up, he reads the will and uh, the guys, I'm explaining this so badly. Basically the guy's grandfather, who died he left his entire like billions of billions of dollars to this random girl avery and now his entire family so that's his like two daughters uh and his four grandsons and then some like other crazy people are all like whoa why is this going on and so the entire story is avery kind of like figuring out why he left this inheritance what's like this whole deal with this guy his name is tobias hawthorne that's the basic plot and then of course there's like other layers like the fact that Given that it's a book talk sensation, of course there has to be romance. So she's constantly in this like love triangle of her own making with these two boys who Loki have PTSD from various other events. And then like also at the same time, because she like one of the terms of the will states that she has to live in the house, and then of course like people don't want to live to let her live there and to inherit their money. So basically the entire time she's like fighting for her life and she has like security to protect her and stuff, so she's limited in her movements. But that's the basic plot. So since we're on the subject of plot, let's talk about things that we liked and we didn't like and it's the first time that Ira and I are discussing it together so you guys are pretty much on the same page as we are about knowing each other's opinions um well I'll just say it first I think that this TikTok this was basically a bingo list of ticking off all the tropes that book talk is gonna eat right up so Ira if you agree with me why don't we list those tropes out okay wait first book alone love triangle kind of em enemies to lovers vibe weird like mystery uh kind of murder mystery type situation i want to say <sighs> let me use my there's like a lot of like betrayals they love that kind of thing i can add on like cringy nicknames because of course like nobody can call avery by her name i hated those nicknames they sound so bad oh my god so her love is just is like your mystery girl your heiress you're like whatever so he has like, cringy nicknames um of course there's like that stereotype of this super like spoiled rich kids and Avery is like the only one who's like not spoiled and she's supposed to be relatable and in general that factor of relatability is like a big thing because one of the things that I thought was like terrible writing but we'll discuss that in the writing section I guess it's like the fact that Avery is this quiet girl and the first like maybe solid like 10 chapters although it's a trope that continues throughout those books it's just like Oh my god, I'm so normal, <laughs> like, I'm so quiet, why is this happening to me? They're all so different, I'm never gonna fit in, <laughs> like, it's that kind of thing. I don't know if you agree. Um, this was my favorite, I think, like, before, I never really cared for the notes feature on my Kindle, but this book, every time she would be like, she'd be like, I'm just like, I don't understand, I'm so different, I'd be like, bro... <laughs> no, it was just the same thing over and over again, and, okay, this is like also related to writing but in general it's not just her being like oh i'm so like other girls 
I'm not so like other girls and so not like other girls at the same time. It was also the descriptions that she used to talk about the guys. Like, I mean, when one of the boys like walked in and it was her first meeting with him, she's just like, his gray eyes, his jaw, he smirked, his like sharp cheeks, his Armani suit. And I'm just reading this and I'm like, what in the young adult version of Fifty Shades of Grey? No, I also thought that I literally highlighted it because he's, I thought this was so funny. It's it's like, his voice would have been pleasant to listen to if it weren't for the words. A guy who thinks he knows everything I muttered, that's new. A girl with a razor sharp tongue. <laughs> He's, he returned, silver eyes focused on mine, the ends of his uh, lips sticking upward. I was like, girly, what is going on? <laughs> you just met this man. No, I know this really, like, this is like, we stepped away from the topic of plot, which by the way, I have to say, like, I don't think the plot is anything special. Like, it's just a trope that's been going on for literal years before this book and it's a trope that's going to be on for years after this book like this idea of a girl who comes from nothing like this cinderella story i mean we've had crazy rich asians come out a couple years ago around like the same time like it's not anything new so i don't think that people should expect it to be anything new i thought the plot was like it was fun you know i kind of i've like the only books i've been reading recently were a lot of like Inglit type books because obviously I was taking my exams like Polina. So we read a lot of like <sighs> Sailor Who Fell from Grace with the Sea, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Eyre. And you know, like pff, obviously the writing and plot of this book is nothing like kind of those kind of classic literature type things. But you know what? After like having to sit through Jane Eyre, I was like, God, I missed. <laughs> I missed like just like the silliest plots of like so much going on. Like why are there 400 like characters? What are they all doing? Where are they all coming from? But I don't know. I just had a lot of fun. <laughs> Wait, no, I actually, let's pause on this point for a bit because I like I do think that's really important to talk about. Like, we're about to be such haters on this book, but also I feel like it's so important to realize that it's like young adult and it wasn't supposed to be like intellectual. It's supposed to be for fun. And the first time I read it, I enjoyed it and I still have that feeling now. I still enjoyed it, even though I think that there are a lot of points that could be better. And I feel like it's what you say, like when you read a lot of English type of books, people come to book talk to escape and to relax and I don't think it's really necessarily judging them for wanting to relax I just feel like it could have been written a bit better but at the same time I do want to say that a strong point of the book is that I feel like it really keeps you engaged throughout because like Ira said it's like super funny and there's a lot of drama and the second point I want to say is that all of it is Okay, I don't know if you will agree with me, Ira, you can talk about this next, but I actually felt like the drama and the mystery aspect of it was sustained quite well throughout the whole book series, from the first book to the third book. You know what? Yeah, like maybe the mystery does get convoluted, like at times, no, it does not make sense uh, at every turn, but it's like a lot of fun, you know? I kind of I kind of missed like those ran random kind of mystery style books, you know, this like I think if I read this when I was like 13 to 15, this would have been my favorite, favorite, favorite book for like at least a couple months because I don't know, I just I would have loved that kind of thing when I was younger. Oh, I agree with that, but I also have another thing that I want to say, which like not to get dark about book talk and kind of go into a separate direction, but I feel like there's a major problem with these kinds of books being marketed like YA. Like, and I'm not the type of person to say like you shouldn't be reading this at 13, but I feel like the like the more the book progresses, the more it's clear that it's not for 13 year olds, because most of the jokes are aimed at older audiences and there are a lot of innuendos. And actually Avery, she's like 17 and then she turns 18 by like the end so I feel like it's a bit strange to be saying like oh it's for 13 year olds even though I know that I would have loved this at 13 I just feel like maybe 13 is not the target audience so book talk marketing it like that is a bit strange you said you really enjoyed the book when you first read it but when I first when I read this book the first time because Polina and I reread the first one for this um I remember reading the first one, I remember like being the biggest, biggest hater. And then I read it this time, I'm like, okay, I'm kind of having fun. And I realized it's because I hated Jameson. <laughs> I, was like, I was like sitting there and I was like, why did I dislike this so much when I read it the first time? And then I, 
And then I really thought about it and I guess I figured it out. You texted me and you're like, oh, why did I hate this the first time? And I was thinking that the reason that you didn't like it was because it's literally so like what bad coded. Oh, maybe we can talk about predictability. Okay, well, personally, I saw a lot of things that were revealed to us a lot of the things that were like the big reveal at the end of the book but i didn't see a lot of the small things on the way to the big reveal so i feel like overall the balance was fine it's not the most unpredictable book but it's also not the most predictable book either it's just okay there are things you can guess and there are things that you might not guess if you've not been paying attention I think, uh, I mean, this is kind of a major spoiler. I think the one that the most obvious thing, like when they first brought up Toby's death, like the son, I was like, oh, he's going to be alive and we're going to be looking for him. Like you could immediately kind of guess that that's going to be Harry. But I think other than that, I was just kind of like along for the ride, just kind of enjoying. Okay, um, what do we think about the ending? Like I genuinely want to hear your thoughts about the ending and about her giving the money away. Because, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is kind of blood money, so I feel like I would give it away in the same way that she does. But, I don't know, I was kind of hoping for a more interesting, like, ending. Yeah, I feel like that's a really valid point about the ending, that it's blood money and that it's good to give it away. I would have given it away as well, especially because, as you said, it's not, a, as they said, really, it's not about the money at some point, it's about the power. An ending that was also super predictable, so it wasn't as much of a twist as the author hoped it was. Yeah, I feel like a lot of the ending was predictable, and, I mean, it comes a lot of it like from the writing i guess not that the writing is bad but it's just like the clues that are meant to hint towards the ending so it's like you do get the sense of like there are clues in the beginning that do make sense for the ending but they're so kind of obvious that the ending becomes even more predictable you know when they all go down into that like uh, underground like cellar or like i don't know where they are underground in the first book and they all open that door together the five of them the four brothers and her and so they open their letters and they get like all the boys kind of react in a way and then um she opens uh her little like envelope and there's like a single packet of sugar and then before that she was like dreaming about building the little sugar fortress i don't know i was like okay you kind of ate with that a little bit but also like most obvious reveal ever <laughs> okay yeah i feel like that's a really valid point but also like before we talk more about the writing, I want to hear your opinion on the clues in general. What do we think? Are the clues like that obvious? Are they intricate? W what are your thoughts on them? Um, I don't know. Like, for example, the keys from the first book, that's kind of like the most memorable one to me because it like, I thought it was quite interesting. And like, it is guessable to just like the average person, like if you think about it. And then, but... I kind of hated the level of deus ex machina in the entire book where it's like the house is just insane and big and everything is hidden everywhere and there's like secret passages and secret ladders that even the people living there for the past like 20 years don't know about. I thought that was a bit like too much. Like, like, okay, Looney Tunes. <laughs> Yeah, okay, I kind of agree with you that it's too much, but I also feel like, because what you were saying about like the keys and, and everything, it's interesting, but I have a feeling that a lot of the clues that they solve, the reader wouldn't really be able to solve, because a lot of it relies on the house and information about the house, as you say. So it's like, oh, Avery just remembers that there's a chandelier that matches the description. Well, how am I supposed to know that? It's not like I've seen the house, right? It's not like we had this like long description of a chandelier. It's just like, oh, I've seen it somewhere. So I feel like there are not enough clues that are actually given to the reader when it comes to the house and i also feel like a lot of the palindromes and rearranging the letters and all those kinds of things like i feel like it's a bit fake how quickly they just do it like instantly because it do there's no not a single moment in the entire trilogy when after they've been given this random collection of letters there's a pause and then they say the answer it's just like they instantly say the answer which like i understand that they've been doing it for like 18 years of their life but also like humans need time to think and i feel like that was a bit unrealistic and kind of put me off it because i really felt like dumb because i needed time to think about it and they're just like rolling on and moving on yeah i was also thinking about that like yeah again the like the house is like presented as like an infinite 
kind of just like whatever the author needs to happen it happens like the chapel comes out of nowhere for the third book and it's like it plays a really big thing but we only see uh what was her name nana gran i forgot what they called her we only see her there in that book like i feel like you could have started hinting at like more of the locations that would be important like earlier on because just the house is like presented as being enormous and then i feel like it's kind of a cop-out to have this enormous house where like just like anything can appear anything can be anywhere there's like these secret rooms whatever whatever like i feel like at some point you need to just kind of calm down a bit yeah yeah i would agree and it's also it's not just the house that i feel like there needs to be a toning down of the situation i get that the whole idea is that i mean it's not a major spoiler but that every one of the four hawthorne grandsons is like born to a different father but at some point when i was reading about all these four different fathers when it all starts coming together i'm just like is this really relevant? Like, I understand that it's character development, but at the same time, like, I feel like it's just such a cheap side plot to be like, yeah, it's the father of the kid who's jealous. And I was just like, okay, like, here we go again. Like, you'd think that the guy Sheffield, uh, Sheffield? Yeah, Sheffield Grayson would act, like, earlier. Like, why did it take him, like, 20 years to uh, finally have some sort of revenge on uh, the Hawthorns? Even, like, and you could argue, like, oh, he would, like, kill Avery or whatever, and then uh, he'd get her fortune. But he wouldn't, obviously, because we know about the whole, like, charity. Like, if she doesn't get the thing, then it goes to charity. So, yeah, it did, like, it just didn't really make sense. Like, you'd think he would have done something earlier, like, 20 years ago when, like, the thing actually happened. In the fourth book, um, you, you get, like, Grayson's side of the story as he's trying to figure out all the Sheffield Grayson thing. And, like... I feel like that's done a lot better, but I 100% agree that in the the, the the original trilogy of the first three, it's just not clear at all. And I feel like, okay, this actually links into series as a whole, but I feel like it's a major problem that because the author has a long-term plan planned out, it's like some books are written and structured better than others. Some of them are so forgettable and then you only remember like key details because in general it's not presented as this perfect package deal which i think is a major flaw because you're initially planning a series stuff should be better distributed in all of the four books but that's just me what you said especially about the like forgettable part i was reading the third book and uh when you're reading the third book uh avery throughout the whole thing is hinting at this like uh like encounter she had with grayson in a wine cellar and I remember reading it and I was like, I don't remember this at all from the second book. I don't remember them going anywhere, like doing anything. What is going on? And it was like, the point was that she was uh, talking about a flashback that happens later in the book. But it's like, I was so confused. I was like, is the second, was the second book so forgettable to me that I forgot this like whole encounter, even though I was like really rooting for Grayson to be with Avery? <laughs> No, literally, like, you're so right about the whole cellar thing, and I think that was particularly badly done, because, like, genuinely, what was that about? The timeline was really off, and in the fourth book, the timeline was super confusing as well, because I just finished reading the fourth one yesterday, and it was like, the stuff with Grayson sorting out the Sheffield is before Avery actually says that she's planning to host a game, like, at her house. It's supposed to be a sequel, so most of the stuff happens after she's given away the money. So it makes no sense, because it was in the same interview that she declared that she's giving away all the money and that she's going to host this game of all games. So I feel like the timing went completely off by the end of the book, and it was just a lot better in the first book. But at the same time, the first book was also the least complicated and the most like easy to swallow, so I guess that's why. Yeah, that's also what I'm thinking. The first book and the second book, I'd say, are paced pretty well. Like you you get the experience it's not like too fast not too slow like perfect and knows how to like keep the situation like the author is in control of the like time that you're reading and like the effect it's having and whatever whatever the third book it starts kind of to fall off and i haven't started reading the fourth one yet i'm gonna get to that a bit later but yeah from what you're saying it seems like it's it's not like con the writing and like the pacing is not very consistent yeah, yeah, I, 
I definitely. And also, like, about the pacing, um, what do we think about the short chapter length? Personally, I'm a fan because I feel like it helps speed up the narrative along, but at the same time, I feel like some of the some of the chapters were structured slightly weirdly, as in it cuts off strangely before it moves on to the next one. Like, it feels like some information should have been better spaced out, but in general, the short chapter lengths play to the book's advantage. Really? I was gonna tell you that I hated that the chapters were all so short. I was like, I was like, it felt like there was a new chapter every like couple of pages. I'm like, there doesn't need to be 91 chapters in this book. Like you could have combined a few of them. My main, yeah, you're so right about them cutting off in weird parts though. Cause like sometimes it like makes a lot of sense. So I have this highlighted because I thought it was like so good. From the time he was 12 or 13, started writing in odd uh, fashion, very distinctive mix of print and cursive. I've seen that handwriting before. I have a secret I could hear my mother telling me less than a week before she died about the day you were born cuts off chapter i'm like ooh, perfect cliffhanger perfect setup very good ending dramatic brilliance but sometimes it's like the cutoff is kind of strange and like you it wants that like drama and cliffhanger but then it's like too dramatic for example like she's like in school um when she first comes to school in the third book or in the first book and Thea is like talking to her and Thea goes like you know the like last girl who got too close to the Hawthorns she died and then the like chapter ends and you're like oh this is a bit too much for like just the middle of a school day i agree okay and i actually think that this is the perfect way to transition to the thing that i particularly want to talk about which is the writing style in general like not just the plot twist the puzzles and whatever the fact that a lot of it was so dramatic that I couldn't help but make fun of the book so many times because I understand that the whole purpose of this book is for fun. It's fun. Nobody's denying it. I had fun reading it. It was a nice distraction from all the other documents and stuff I'm, I have to be doing right now. Like, yeah, whatever. It was great. The thing that I don't like is that so much of it was dramatic 14 year old on Wattpad core <laughs> that like I couldn't I couldn't take it seriously at times even when it was supposed to be serious. <laughs> Yeah, no, you're so right. I think I was thinking about this specifically in like the third book where a lot of the like interpersonal drama like kicks up and there's like a lot of Jameson and Avery talking and Jameson is saying like, he's being so dramatic. He's like, I would die for you. And he's like saying whatever, 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 whatever. And it's like, like I, that's sweet, I guess. But it's also like, you're 19. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Like you're 19. <laughs> Just because we're on the topic, I also want to read some pas some of my favorite passages. Uh, I think we should take turns reading some of our quotes, and you can talk about how much fun you had with the Kindle feature. But um, like, okay, some of the stuff I'm gonna read, it's not bad because it's dramatic. It's just not good. For example, let me, let me start reading. This is literally the first page, chapter one, and it's like one longest lasting game was called I Have a Secret because my mom said that everyone should always have at least one. Some days she guessed mine, some days she didn't. We played every week right up until I was 15 and one of her secrets landed her in the hospital. The next thing I knew she was gone and then it's like, your move princess. A gravely voice dragged me back to the present. I don't have all day. Not a princess, I retorted. It's like Lighting one of my nights into place. Your move, old man. And reading this, I was just like, okay, this is so young adult core when they have this super dramatic flashback and then they're pulled back into the present and like the characters all have nicknames for each other, like princess, queen, whatever. That reading this on the first page, I was just thinking like, okay, like it, we just met this girl and she's already telling us about her dead mother. <laughs> like, is this really, what happened to hello? How are you, you know? <laughs> No, because you're so right, because I literally have, um, like, the first or second page of um, uh, the second book, the first chapter, like, first couple of pages, and there's also, like, um, she's talking to Jameson, whatever, whatever, and then she says, like, there was something about the way he said the word you, like I was someone, like I mattered, but Jameson and I had been down that road before. Girl! <laughs> Shut up! It's the first chapter. I don't want to know about your guys' drama. Like, I don't care. 
No, that and also it's like, this is what I hate about books like these. It's not just that y you don't want to know, it's that you, you don't particularly care because there was nothing done to actually character develop yet. Like, this is not character development. This is just her talking to another random guy. Like, it's it's just so strange and also it's not i i also want to address this to all authors out there it's not good character development either when you're just using tropes like checklist tropes and saying girls like me because i have this also highlighted i was in the middle of drafting an english paper in spanish class when i was called to the office girls like me were supposed to be invisible we didn't get summoned for sit downs with the principal we made exactly as much trouble as we could afford to make which in my case was non and i was just like okay like so why is she quiet why is she like this why can she not afford to make this it's so dramatic when she says things about herself. You're not in a rom-com. You gotta show it. You gotta stop telling us. Like, I'm being so for real right now. I also highlighted that because I was gonna make fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> I want to hear you make fun of this too because like this line is just pretty different. Like This is so specific about the writing, but I hated the way Max talked, like the fake, uh, fake, like the fake cursing. I was like, okay, Sesame Street, just don't, just don't put that in. Just be like, she cursed, full stop. Yeah. No, it, it, you're, you're so real for that. Also, I don't really understand. It goes back to what we talked about earlier, about how it's not really clear who this book is marketed for. Because what's the problem of either using a curse word or bleeping it out? Because to be honest, I don't understand this problem that people have with seeing curse words in books. Like, if you don't want to, don't say it. It's it's the way that some people talk is that they use expletives. It's conversational style. They, I mean, even if you look at the catcher in the rye, it's like, I mean, yeah, it has swear words and stuff, but it's also this, like the talking style of the main character too. So I don't really understand why they had to make Max talk like that because it was so fake and also I don't really understand the reasoning because if the entire reason that Max was using these words is to make sure her mother didn't hear her like it was pretty obvious from the context what she wanted to say so like I feel like it's not really a solution you don't really need to give this in the video because I'm gonna swear but <laughs> you know the line where she meets Nash and she says his voice is slow and smooth like whiskey I just wrote I hate this simile whiskey tastes like shit <laughs> <laughs> I'm so keeping that in because that's so good. I just have a problem, like a major problem with some of the similes that were used in the book and also just some of the comparisons. For example, I couldn't shake the feeling that not knowing was a liability, like standing on train tracks but not knowing which direction the train was coming from. And I'm just like, girl, does it really matter which direction the train is coming from? You're on a train track. If your mom doesn't want you cursing, then she would still be upset about you fake cursing because she knows that you're you want to curse you're just not saying those exact words so it's like what is it with young adult writers and near incest tropes like for example do you remember cassandra Clare? oh my god i was really gonna say that sorry I'm interrupting. what was that book called shadow hunters shadow something yeah shadow hunters but that was because it was based of a ron Ginny fanfic Oh my, yeah. No, but it's just like, it's featured in, in this book. I, I have a quote. Okay, maybe this is like my personal trigger, but in the third book when Eve showed up and it's like that trope when Grayson is like in love with Eve and then Avery is like, does, doesn't trust her and she's trying not to sound jealous. I hate that trope, like with a burning passion, because I feel like it really sets women against each other. Like it's just saying like, oh, the only reason she doesn't like Eve is because Grayson likes her, when I don't think that that's the case, even though it might be partly the case. And the way that Grayson and Jameson just assumed, I it's not like a trope. It's not a trope that's bad on the writer's part. It's just a trope that I don't personally like because it leaves a bad taste like in your mouth when you're reading it. I don't know if you have the same thing. Same thing. No, you know this is what I was gonna say. My kind of controversial take is, um, isn't it kind of weird that the vast majority like of female characters are like kind of presented as like 
in a bad like in a bad light like most of the dudes like the main dudes the like four grandsons they're always like so you know put together they're the smartest they're like the strongest they're the i don't know most powerful whatever whatever but then a lot of the women characters like zara and sky they they're both like mega haters and i guess you would understand in their position but sky like tries to kill avery um Rebecca doesn't really talk to uh, Avery that much. Emily is also painted in, like, she's quite literally a lot of the time, like, said that she played games with people. She was very manipulative. You have Thea, like, betraying Avery in the second book to save Rebecca. You have Rebecca's mom, like, falling apart. She's never, like, she's an alcoholic. She's not doing well. You have um, Mrs. Laughlin, who, like, or Lachlan, I don't know how to pronounce it, I'm sorry, who, like, is also, like, a mega Avery hater, even though she doesn't really have any reason to be. So it's like, why are a lot of the female characters, like, like that, you know? Most of the men, they're like, oh, he's so strong, he's so smart, he's so brave, whatever. But then a lot of the women, you're just supposed to, like, like Avery. And then there's, like, there's Max and, um, what was her name again? Libby? But their only real role is to, like, kind of support Avery when she's upset and also dates the other Hawthorne brothers. So, I don't know. I'm like, yeah. would it, like, why could Libby or Max not have played a more important role? Oh, and also, yeah, obviously Eve with the big betrayal, which was kind of obvious, but, like, you know. So, yeah, no, I agree with you. And I also feel like even then, because the, like, the whole narrative centers around Avery and every other girl is just a cardboard cutout. But I still feel like okay, we're just going to mix plot and characters together. Like, we, either and I had this entire plan to be super organized in our discussion, but no, it's not going to work out. <laughs> I don't think it is. But like for plot and characters, I just want to say that I feel like the guys weren't developed that well either. Like, if you think about it, the only thing we know about Grayson is that he's like upset about Emily. He thinks that he's guilty. He's like hot and he wears an Armani suit and he's super fragile and he wants to protect everyone and won't tell anyone he needs help. You're saying Grayson's like character development is like very surface level and it is but he also gets the most character development out of all the boys mm -hmm. exactly and that's the problem in its entirety and more than that i just i know i just jumped off topic but going back to what you said about like libby and max being centered around avery if grayson is the character who gets the most development weirdly enough avery isn't particularly well developed she's just the girl everything revolves around so her being like oh i'm so unlucky i've been thrust into this like entire mansion and then saying like oh actually i am super lucky because i'm literally a billionaire now it's all also like very superficial and it's also very obvious as development and i hate that everyone else like everyone else's personality centers around her when she doesn't have any personality to really center around and what you said about like Max and Libby and Avery not really having a real friend I feel like it was just also so bad to make sure that Max was dating Xander and Libby was dating Nash and it's like oh look how perfect Avery and all her friends lives are they're all dating the Hawthorne brothers like is that not a little bit like too much? My thought is here are my two hot takes. There could have been three Hawthorne brothers. Four is too many. Real. Four is too many. You needed three at most. If you really wanted to smash it down, you could have two, and then Max could have been a dude, and the love triangle element could have been Avery deciding between her past life and her like new life, because then that could have given her character some depth, because all we really know about her is that she played chess with Harry in the park, and she loves her mom. True. I absolutely so agree. No, I'm sorry. That was so brutal. Like, that was such a brutal hot take. Basically saying, like, the author should have done it completely differently. But I 100% agree. Like, as fun as the book was, it could have just been so much better, which I think is the major problem in all of Book Talk books. They're not terrible, but they're also not great. Like, they can be better. And I also want to talk about the mom, because you just brought her up right now. 
I absolutely hated the way that they used the mom because it's like it's always that trope of this mother who's so loving and so perfect and then she dies and she suffers and she has this terrible depressing end to her life and everybody just talks talks about her and then they just forget about her and you have zero under like understanding of this woman and I feel like that was the situation with Avery's mom because we all we found out was that she was like the sister of one of the girls who died in the fire who Tobias Hawthorne killed and then she helped Tobias Hawthorne like get on his feet again and that's it and you don't have anything like you don't have her point of view you don't have like her dialogue she's just kind of irrelevant and the whole thing revolves around Avery liking her mom and we don't get we don't get to see a reason for why she even likes her mom in the first place yeah I did also think about that because her mom it, it's the trope, trope of like the mother is redeemed in death like whatever wrong she could have done whatever mistakes she could have made by by dying she becomes a martyr almost yeah no and it's also like not to be a hater but why is it always like the mom has to die and the guy is like the most alcoholic abusive father there is like can we not start i don't know challenging these tropes in any way <laughs> Oh, well, also, that's, like, we, the, like, only other personality, tra personality trait that Avery has is um, wanting to visit the places her mom, like, had the postcards of from Toby. Oh, my, yeah. Uh, she just says, yeah, I want to travel. Like, what do you want to do with the money? I want to travel, which is, like, fair, but it's, like... That, and also, um, it's, like, technically, it's the Hawthorne series is the first three books, and then the two others are a follow-up, and they're not directly connected, because it's... A, like gray 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 and jameson's point of view but i started reading the fourth one already because we want to do like another video and talk about the other two and i just have a like one major problem even in the sequel in the continuation i've read about maybe like half of it so far and so far it's literally the same thing it's like avery's been using her life to travel to enjoy herself doing what <laughs> Like, I'm so confused. It's just like, Avery's gone to London. Avery's gone to Italy. And I'm like, okay. And, like, she's seeing the places. And what's the goal? Like, she wanted to see these places because of her mom. Okay, but what is she doing? Because if it's just like, oh, she's visiting another place and then she comes back. Like, what's the point? I don't understand. And it's the same with Jason. He's going with her. And he's also like, he doesn't understand what he's doing. Nobody, none of the characters, what I really don't like is none of the characters seem to have a sole purpose in life. Like, even Eve, her purpose was like, oh, um, I will get to inherit the money. And then throughout all of this, her trope just ended. The plot just ended. And, oh, okay, she got the money. And what happened next? We don't have any indication of what's going on. <laughs> she doesn't have a lot of character, but sometimes she's really funny. Because um, I have this line from... Uh, what chapter is this? I don't know. I don't care. Basically, um, there's this big standoff between Jameson and Grayson in the first book. And it's like, he expects me to send Grayson packing. I probably should have, but it was entirely possible that we were wasting our time here. And I had no particular ob objection to wasting Grayson Hawthorne's. And then it's, she's like, he can stay. And then the next line is like, you could have cut the tension in the room with a knife. And then my only comment is, you suck so bad, <laughs> in all caps. <laughs> yeah, and also speaking of Grayson Hawthorne, I just also have this one line that a that Avery has said about Grayson Hawthorne, which I think deserves to be featured in this video. I was an intelligent person, but Grayson Hawthorne might as well have been speaking Swedish. I have another one that's like another one of her like actually pretty fun lines. Um, she says uh, she's talking to Zara. And Zara says, you're young enough, her, uh, Zara said, her voice almost wistful, to believe that money solves all ills. And then um, Avery thinks, spoken like a person so rich, she can't imagine the weight of problems money can solve. I'm like, okay, girl boss, you did kind of eat that a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no in general the, the the lines about money were pretty good like the fact that at some point it's not about money it's about power is absolutely true and i think the author nailed it but it's just all the rest of it that is just a bit ridiculous in a fun way i feel like we should move like since we're like talking about avery's personality so much we should move into like characters generally my question to you is 
Did you like Jameson or Grayson more? Because I'm so mad she didn't end up with Grayson. I thought Jameson was so annoying. <laughs> I think you have a great point. Um, okay, there's just one thing that I would say that made me understand why she chose Jameson. The moment when he, like when the plane exploded and he didn't run for her and she was like, okay, like he hesitated, he doesn't choose me, but he literally spent the entire book after that choosing her, protecting her, going against Eve, trying to cover up the Sheffield Grayson story. He. I, I just feel like out of the two brothers, he's more mature and she's someone she's someone like who needs that support, who needs that support because she's desperate for it. And I feel like because the whole point, the whole reason why she chose Jameson was because like the quote was something like, he makes me feel alive. He doesn't protect me. I get to live my life. And I'm just like, yeah, but also Grayson, you can have fun with Grayson. like. It's, it's just both of them are not the greatest choice, but if I was gonna choose, I would choose Grayson. I mean, like, for her, I feel like it does make sense because he's kind of like, they've got the same kind of, uh, uh, what's, like, obsession with the puzzles, I guess. Like, they're both willing to continue. Like, even when she was like, like, she's not gonna focus on her emotions. She's not gonna focus on, like, having a personality, you know? She's gonna, sorry, she's gonna, like, go do the puzzles or whatever which is the same as jameson grayson he kind of does get some level of depth which he just doesn't he gets like he's hurt he's he's like he's feeling a lot of emotions you know he's upset that emily died he's uh like kind of dealing with not being the heir like he's got a lot going on and that makes him like like to a reader i feel like a more interesting character and like partner than jameson but like for avery they've got about the same level of depth so it does make sense why they're together i agree i feel like that's the reason why she chose chose him as you say like the reader and her perception is two very different things like isn't that the perpetual problem with these kinds of books like think back to the hunger game where everyone was either team pita or team gail and it's like one of them makes sense and one of them is just reader's favorite so i guess we always have that wall between us and her but it's also what the author allows us to see and i still feel like she allows us to see only a limited like a limited part of it and I also don't like that towards the end of the book you could really feel like the moment when the author starts manipulating us to choose Jameson and I really don't like that because I feel like it was so obvious and it spoiled like the the whole like tension. Yeah I feel like the second book was really good in the way of kind of letting us Avery and us kind of explore what her being with Grayson would be like. I just like I feel like they had so such better chemistry you know xander was also a victim of the quirky like tiktok character archetype him like this line there are no losers in robot battle deathmatch fight club xander said stoically there are only winners and people whose robots sort of explode okay <laughs> No, literally. I feel like Sander's entire development was that he's like this quirky boy whose mind thinks in strange ways, who's always down to like make things explode, eat scones and help Max. And I'm just like, okay, like it's again, it's it's just a stock character essentially for a lot of the for a lot of these people. And also like I'm sorry, I, I keep hating on Avery, but it's just like some of the stuff that she says. But not gonna lie, this quote was low-key kinda funny. Like I actually laughed at this because I feel like a lot of the things that were supposed to be funny were actually not that funny. Or at least well for me they weren't. I maybe for other people they were. But at some point, um she it's like she's meeting Grayson and she's like Grayson is telling her that the letters are not fake that they've been sending to tell her about her inheritance and then she says I knew better than to put any confidence in the assurances of good-looking guys and then she proceeds to put confidences into the hands of looking good-looking guys uh, there's this line where Avery says uh, like it's about Jameson and how she's worried about him cheating her like a game and then she's like I wasn't a puzzle I was just a girl and I was just thinking I'm just a girl 
<laughs> also, this line about Grayson and Jameson and their weird competition over Avery, which once again, like it links back to the whole dating your mother is weird thing, and it also links back to the fact that both Jameson and Grace seem not to have learned their lesson about falling in love with girls that they just met, um, um, and also girls that are like low key slightly dangerous for them and their family, like Emily. But also, like this line, Grayson comes up to her and he's like, "If you were smart," he warned softly, "you'd stay away from Jameson from the game." He looked down from me and i'm like okay like here we go again so much of the drama is just unnecessarily stemming from this whole weird romance with your brother and sister rivalry type thing but also about grayson also about grayson being really dramatic um he finds out sheffield grayson is his dad and then there's the line he just uh, had his world shattered with a re revelation about his father, and he was thinking about me, about Toby, about the signature on my birth certificate. Dude. Yeah. No, that's the other thing. I feel like the more the book progresses, the more Jameson just starts, like, obsessing over Avery. And the same for Grey. And I get that it's the whole thing about Jameson having that hunger in his eyes, but it's also a bit weird. Like, I understand that the whole trope is that the brothers are super damaged, which is why they can't take care of themselves. But also, at some point, I'm just like, maybe you guys should stop thinking about this girl that you met like two months ago and start thinking about yourself, at least a little bit, you know? They, like, they get so obsessed with her so quickly, even though she claims to be just like a normal, normal girly. So it's like, once again, are you the hottest girl boss we've ever seen or not? Yeah, and also not to, like, again, not to be a hater, but <laughs> I'm going to be. You know when Avery has her whole wardrobe change? I hated that scene because after she has that wardrobe change, it's like this whole trope of, like, the gay stylist and this like girl picking out clothes for her and she's like oh i think clothes are so silly i think clothes are so frivolous i never do my makeup and i'm just like can you be screaming i'm not like other girls anymore you know the amount of times i wrote as a note in the first book you are letting some man ruin your life and avery continued to let some man ruin her life Girl, you already have the fortune. You do not need to be dealing with any of these freaks. Like, <laughs> my comment when we find out um, uh, Elisa used to be engaged to Nash, I'm like, you could not pay me to marry any of these freaks. <laughs> <laughs> that's so brutal but also yeah i have the same question like i understand that avery has this whole moral guilt because she stole some random family's inheritance she didn't even steal it like she didn't even know what was going on okay first of all that but also if she really feels guilty why would you continue spending time around them and driving that point home like imo if i felt really bad about something i would just apologize and say look i had nothing to do with this and then go as far away as possible because literally my entire presence would be triggering to them. So why would I purposefully spend more time around these people who don't want to be around me? Like the house, the house is described to be larger than like the Versailles Palace. Like I thought about Tobias Hawthorne about the DNA test that Zara's husband was already running. I don't know. Oh, this is when she says that she thinks that they're not family. It would be a shame, Jameson commented, if we were related. He spared another smile for me, slow and sharp edge. Don't you think? And then it's like, what was it with me and Hawthorne boys? Stop thinking about his smile. Stop looking at his lips. Just stop. And I was like, okay, first of all, this is, and I don't use this word lightly because the word is also its own definition, cringe. <laughs> like, I have no other way to describe this. This whole stop looking at his lips is just so, like, teenage girl thinking about romance core. And the second thing is, what is it with this whole, are we related, are we not related? And the tension between that, like, if you think there's even a possibility of you being related, I would advise you to, I would advise you to keep your hands to yourself, mister. <laughs> Uh, this is why I was super against Libby and Nash being a thing, because they're half sisters and they're half brothers. Like I know, like I don't know, I don't know if that's like legally, technically, there's something wrong with that. But morally, I don't, I don't know how to say this. Like I feel like you shouldn't be your sister shouldn't be dating your like boyfriend's brother. I don't know. 
No, all of it, all of it is weird. The fact that she's dating Jameson, Libby's dating her his brother, and M M Max, her best friend, is dating his other brother. Like speaking of Libby, this was my second point. Nash. I don't know what it was. He just started annoying me. Every time he would stroll in and he'd be like, correction, darling. And then literally my note, like my notes were just like, I know he's supposed to be smooth and charming, but it's like, he's starting to annoy me. He will just come in. He'll be like, uh, I'm a cowboy. Uh, he'll say like two lines and then he'll leave. Like, does he really need to be like a character that exists in the book? No, I have to say Nash had no involvement whatsoever like he'd occasionally show up to help one of his brothers but even if he didn't show up someone else could have showed up he was only there to be a match for libby because she wanted that perfect ending of like look avery is great her sister and her best friend are also dating someone yay once again there should have been three brothers if you really wanted everyone to be with everyone because why is grayson my favorite character um the only one that ends up sad and alone and also going back to Avery and the whole like, I'm so quiet, I'm not like other girls thing. I feel like it's so stupid the way that they had her put herself down the entire book. And she re literally had to like rely on other people for her self-worth. And then also at the same time, there were some passages that made it obvious that she's quote like in quote quotation marks not like other girls like when she spends sp sp like she's okay i'm getting so confused now she spends the entirety of the book telling telling people that she's not like other girls she's quiet and then literally all her actions and everything that everyone else is saying is that you're not like other girls and then she's like, no, but I am like other girls. Like, I am so relatable. So it's just such a weird mix. Like, for example, right after the school that we just talked about, about the Spanish class thing, she was like, unless this was about the weekly poker game I'd been running in the parking lot to finance Harry's breakfast. And I'm just like, girl, nobody runs poker games in the parking lot to fund homeless people's breakfasts. <laughs> like, who are you telling that you're quiet and just like other girls? <laughs> You you either get to be the relatable, fun, uh, kind of main character that the audience can relate to, or you get to be the like really smart, calculating girl boss that she needs to be to solve these riddles. Like I feel like it doesn't, like it's kind of difficult for her to be both. Yeah, and also as you say, like first of all, she she can't be both, but second of all, I kind of like I'm still thinking about the fact that right at the end of chapter one, she just abandoned that whole thing or will she at least try to abandon the whole thing because the last line of chapter one is forget sounding meek forget being invisible and, and i'm just like okay like that was a character arc in record amount of time how long was the first chapter like two pages and in the span of two pages she went from the first line being like i'm not like other girls i'm quiet i'm shy i'm meek to the last line being like forget being meek forget being invisible all in the span of like a hundred or two like a thousand words right like it was just too quick like you gotta decide dude and if you decide that you want to become like the confident girl boss then you need to like have the arc to back it up not just like randomly decide <laughs> that you're gonna be a girl boss we've talked about the bad writing we've given enough examples to write an entire essay about and to obviously have a two-hour video about so what are our conclusions on the book as a whole would you recommend and do you think it's good yeah i think they're a lot of fun i think if i was like like maybe 15 reading this i would have loved them i think i recommend them to people from like kind of like late teenagers maybe more like young adult maybe also um if people that like a good mystery and they like those kind of like book talk tropes of like uh love triangle and like all those kind of messy things so i think it's fun i think i would recommend it probably to someone in that age range but i wouldn't recommend it as like something to like sit down and read and be like really involved in i would just be like this is a fun read for when you just want to pass the time this is like the kind of book i'd be at the airport and i'd be like mm, this is the best thing i've ever read you know yeah i agree it's really good for de-stressing and when you're distracted by other things because it really doesn't require that much mental energy it's specifically one of those books for escapism 
Is it good? Personally, I think it could have been better. Uh, it's not terrible though, so I would agree with your rating. Because the funny thing is, I gave it a 3 out of 5, which is exactly a 6 out of 10 by your scale. So I think we're, we pretty much agree about that. Would I actually recommend it to someone? To be honest, unless they very specifically asked for something that is not overly intellectual, I'd be embarrassed to recommend this. Because I feel like it's just... Like, if you're looking for proper... Okay, if you're looking for like a proper novel with complicated plots, complicated characters and good writing, this is not it. But if you're looking for something fun and for something that you can enjoy, which I which again like is also valid, then I say go for it. And also like if we're really talking about books of recommends, by the way, this series is going to be like a new featured prominent series because I feel like there's so many book talk recs that we have to book talk about. Um, but also if we're talking about book talk recs, it's better than Colleen Hoover. Anything is better than Colleen Hoover. I'm not complaining. <laughs> Selena, thanks for having me on your channel. I had a lot of fun. Um, I was fighting for my life to set up this camera, <laughs> but I really like talking to you because I always like talking to you. You're my best friend ever. Aww. And yeah, I hope everyone likes and subscribes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what else you say. That's it. Thanks, Ira. I like you better than Xander likes his scones. <laughs> so <laughs> that's saying a lot of things. Um, so thank you very much for joining me. And you're obviously going to join me again because I'm not leaving you with any choice. We're going to do more book talk book talks, which I'm sorry. I, I feel like the name is genius still. Um, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far because I'm sure it was a very long video even after I cut out all the unnecessary long parts, right? So thank you so much for watching and if you've enjoyed, leave us a comment and if you've read The Inheritance Games, especially leave us a comment. So thanks so much for watching and bye! Bye!